Hey space fans, Jay Hook here, and I want to show you how to use some of the um, antimatter stuff going on here. I do a lot on antimatter. Um, it's kind of kind of a thing for me. I'm a big fan of the antimatter route to propulsion and power generation um, because if we can truly harness, if we can really figure it out, um, the the I mean, we can do so much. We can just catapult ourselves um, aeons into the future. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to cover reactors uh, first and then propulsion and power generation and maybe how you might combine uh, some of these things together. Okay. All right, so step one, reactors. Uh, you have a few options here. Uh, if you have filter inst extensions installed, you click on KSP Interstellar, you click on reactors, and you got all sorts of choices here. Uh, the ones we're going to look at are the ones that pertain to antimatter. Uh, so we're not going to look at the fission or fusion reactors that we can use here. Uh, we'll get to those um, in future episodes. And of course, you may have seen a couple where I feature this bad boy. Um, also, this bad boy is very useful for supplying both antimatter and positrons for these bad boys. Um, so big happy family there, but we'll get to that. All right, so you got your plasma antimatter power core generator. Um, it looks like the you know, Star Trek-ish warp core kind of thing. You know, it's got that, that action going on where annihilation occurs, you know, somewhere around there or something. <laughs> uh, it, um, unlike the other ones, it has room to store hydrogen and antimatter on board. Um, so you could potentially, let me just root that real quick. You could potentially, um, like, just have this and some radiators and you're good to go. It'll generate power uh, as long as you have fuel for it. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, the other ones that we have here, let's go ahead and do that. So these two, um, the positron antimatter reactor, and then you've got your beam core antimatter reactor. Uh, the positron antimatter reactor likes positrons, of course. Um, so if you go over here to electrostatic antiproton, uh, storage ring or electrostatic positronium storage ring. This one likes positrons. Okay, that's 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 for this one. Okay. Now here's the thing: this reactor will run on antiprotons. It will happily do so. Antiprotons or oh, hang on. Uh, that's right, I need a, a plate thingy. Anyway, so antiprotons or positrons, this positron antimatter reactor will happily chew them both up. However, it will do so much more efficiently with positrons than it will with antiprotons. Um, so you can, you can get it to work with the antiprotons, but it will not run as efficiently or as well or for as long because uh, it will chew through the antiprotons pretty quickly. Um, your positrons will last longer and they're much, much lighter. Uh, so I think a full thing of this um, is six grams of positrons, whereas the container itself weighs um, two tons, <laughs> two thousand kilograms to hold six grams of positrons, whereas the antiproton is two tons and holds one gram of antiprotons. Um, so it's actually um, a lot more energy dense uh, to have those anti or to have the positrons, so that's why you know one unit of positron lasts a long time. It's like one milligram to a unit or something like that. Uh, so um, the beam core reactor here will or should um, actually I haven't tested this one, so we'll do that in this video. Um, but the beam core should also run on either positrons or antimatter or you know antiprotons. Um, we're going to test that one out. Now, you also have the option of using this beautiful thing right here, the antimatter initiated microfusion reactor. It is super cool for um, a big, big reason. It's got great power output. Um, you know, top of the tech tree, you're going to get 10 gigawatts, 10, 10,000 megajoules, um, core temperature 225,000 Kelvin. Uh, it's, it's a beast, you know, at just two and a half meters and it only weighs 9.24 tons. Um, so just over 9,000 kilograms for all that power is, it makes this one impressive. Now if you look over here, 
Um, it doesn't like magnetic nozzles, but it loves plasma nozzles, and it's 50% on thermal nozzles. Um, and then with power generation, it is about 50% on the thermal generation, 50% um, on charged particles, but it really loves that MHD, the magneto magnetohydrodynamic something or other generator. Uh, what's the thing called? Uh, magnetohydrodynamic electric generator, yeah. Um, which itself weighs six tons. So if you want to use this for electrical generation, you still need one of these generators, which, you know, they weigh a bunch. Um, this uh, thermal electric effect generator, I need to do some testing on this one. It's new. I haven't used it out too much yet, um, but I'm going to get to that one eventually, and we'll do some tutorials on that. But for now, um, we're going to stick to these. Uh, so this antimatter initiated microfusion reactor, it's great for power generation. It's great for um, uh, propulsion. Um, it's not like the best at any of those particular things, but it's great at doing, you know, multiple jobs. It can do, you know, if you have this reactor on here, it can perform multiple functions on your vessel instead of having multiple reactors. Or you could have this one just performing a solid, you know, it, you can do whatever you want. All right, so the plasma reactor here, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's go ahead and grab that guy back. All right, so the plasma um, antimatter power generator here, it's got its own generator installed, so you don't need to install um, an electric generator like you do with uh, this one or this one or this one. These all need generators attached if you're going to use them for electrical power production. This one does not, uh, which makes it awesome. Um, you slap that on, and actually I should be using the um, structural disks, little hub things. Those really... Uh, they also come packed with electric charge, so it keeps your um, things from blowing up. <laughs> um, and it definitely also makes it easier to actually put those on there. Um, so definitely use the, uh, the toroidal hubs along with your um, antimatter rings if you go the ring route. This is actually a pretty primitive way of storing them. It's not the best way of storing antimatter. Um, you know, you really want to condense it down into anti-hydrogen, okay? With uh, one of these dimagnetic containers, but, you know, be warned. They have a maximum temperature and acceleration tolerance, which makes them heavier when you bump them up. So you can, you know, tweak that to make sure that your uh, shows the part mass change down here. So when you turn it all the way up, just to let you know when it's empty, it's 0 0.330 tons, uh, so 330 kilograms. Um, it's not like the heaviest, but it's not the lightest. Now, if you turn the tolerances all the way down to where you sneeze on this thing and it explodes, uh, it weighs nothing. It's like made of paper, you know. <laughs> it's like one thousandth of a ton. Uh, so it's like it's like one kilogram. <laughs> um, so one kilogram. There you go. Of paper mache holding your antihydrogen in there. I recommend you know, setting reasonable values for this, depending on what you're going to do. Um, rule of thumb, uh, further out from the star, from, you know, further out into the solar system, you need less of this because your temperatures are going to be lower and your expected acceleration is going to be pretty low. Uh, when your inner core planets, um, probably going to have higher temperatures and more acceleration because you're going to be burning heavier engines because of more gravity, et cetera, et cetera. You probably want a more robust container. Okay. All right. Now, um, we did a few videos there showing how this actually turns this, or turns um, anti protons and positrons into anti hydrogen, how to use those. So, go ahead and check that video out um, in the positrons and lasers and sales of my video. Okay. So, feed the beam core protons and antiprotons. Feed it antimatter and matter. You can't just have antimatter on it. Um, now if you supply pr positrons to this thing, it won't complain about not having matter because you can collide a positron with anything. <laughs> um, and it'll find an electron to, to annihilate. That's kind of how it goes. Matter's got electrons attached to it. Um, but if you want to use antiprotons, give it a proton uh, to annihilate with or it's going to get really, really lonely. Okay, so you go over to your fuel tanks and you find yourself some hydrogen. You don't actually need a lot. And while you have a lot of options here, you want to know what my favorite one is? Uh, if you have the interstellar fuel switch installed, you take your old school xenon container 
and use that. Uh, so let's go ahead and throw some structurality on this thing. And I'm going to go old school and just use the ring um, because I think that's fun. And then let's go ahead and do one of these, maybe right there. Did that line up? Yeah. All right, so we do that. It's got xenon. We don't want xenon. We want hydrogen. There we go. Hydrogen gas. This is enough hydrogen gas in these three tanks to last this thing for like a thousand years of operation, ten thousand years of operation. It doesn't need much, but it, you need some. Okay. All right. So we got beam core. We got antimatter. Uh, let's go ahead and put, you know, 500. We'll, we'll just go with 500 units. We'll, we'll just say we are. Um, that stuff's expensive, um, which is why it's better to refuel these things out in orbit, construct them in orbit, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, fuel. This thing. Uh, liquid hydrogen. That's what that's what we want to burn. So we're gonna grab this big sphere tank right there. Um, that weighs a lot. Uh, do we want it that big? Let's go a little smaller. A little smaller. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good size. All right, let's go with that. Okay. Uh, let's get a probe. I like the um, docking ports there the um, orbital assembly docking ports with the KSP Interstellar Extended Mod. They are so super cool because they have a probe core and an antenna and it saves me on parts. So that's our vessel. Uh, control. Let's, let's, put a, let's put a wheel in there somewhere. There we go. Okay, cool. Good enough, right? Am I forgetting anything? Radiators. Yeah, that's right. Radiators. Okay, so so where does all the heat go? Alright, um, this thing's going to produce 18 terawatts of power. Um, that, would, that would take a monstrous amount of radiators, right? Well, maybe not. Um, it's kind of more... Well, uh, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you. Let's let's directly attach one of these bad boys. Yeah, yeah. Let's flip it around so it doesn't look all weird. Attach directly attach one of those bad boys. Okay. Now that's only going to give us two and a half gigawatts of uh, power. So let's go ahead and scale it up to three seven five. All right. So we got about six gigawatts of power. Right. Seems reasonable. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, um, now, of course, I, I would normally build this thing in orbit, but for expeditiousness um, in time, we're just going to go ahead and pretend that we built it in orbit and just kind of launch it. Uh, is that going to fall over? Nah, probably. Well, I don't really have anywhere else to put a thing, so. Boop. <laughs> Okay, let's do one of those. Okay, all right, so it took me a second and I now realize how dumb I am. All right, so this thing does act as a receiver uh, for beamed power. Uh, it's a thermal receiver, so you might do well with a thermal power generator attached to said receiver. Um, not attached to the antimatter reactor, but attached to the receiver. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, we're going to go ahead and bump this up a little bit too, just just because. Alright, so, yeah, giant, uh, a, lot of, a lot of radiation. This front one here, actually, that reminds me, um, if I do that, these are actually going to block it. So I better give it a little, little bit of room from the back. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's that's enough for fooling around with that. All right. So let's uh, let's try this one last time. Uh, okay. So 
here we go once again. Um, you know, we're just gonna we're just gonna go into orbit of Kerbin. We're not even gonna rendezvous, and mess with any of that. We're just gonna go straight for it. Let's see, if we can launch ourselves. Okay. Now that we're on the daylight side of things. We have a good connection there to our power satellite, right there. Turn on our power receiver interface. And of course we aren't getting any reception because we're not pointed at it. Let's see if we can change that. the wrong side to receive from. Oh, so it is. Okay. All right, so that's duly noted. These are received from that side. <laughs> no problems there. All right, so we've got that going. Got about five gigawatts available because we're really just getting kind of a deflecting push there. Okay, here we go. What we've all been waiting for. the engine and there we go teeny tiny bit and we're already producing 100 kilonewtons if I floor it I'm getting a couple hundred kilonewtons now of course you see it overheats pretty quickly so you do want to have a lot of a lot of radiator action going on but we just go ahead and point this way uh, now we don't hardly have any power whatsoever, so about seven, eight hundred megawatts and climbing. So we get barely a kilonewton before we lose power. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move along a little bit. Now we're getting about six gigawatts. Matter. Rats. Okay, so what you really want to do is scale that beam core reactor down, <laughs> uh, is what I was able to discover. Um, the larger ones are super powerful, but also produce more waste heat than I can actually manage comfortably. So yeah, okay, whatever. Um, but if you scale it down to 1.25, uh, it becomes a lot easier to manage with what I've got set up here. Um, so let's 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 take a look at this. So 1.25 for the beam core, 1.25 for the magnetic nozzle, uh, same size for everything else. Okay. Um, I'm pointed at Minmus because it's uh, the power relay satellites like over there somewhere. I think. Let me. Oops. No. 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 that in that direction somewhere, I think. All right, so we're getting about five gigawatts of power uh, available to us. Uh, so we can pretty much point prograde. I think it'll stay on, yeah. Okay, uh, we're using the rear panel here for beam power and the other two for radiator so that we can do a little bit better. So here we go. Um, I did a quick test. It used quite a bit of positron so we'll, or antimatter, so we'll leave that open as well. All right, this is just a, a test uh, craft. Nothing like saying that this is exactly how you build an antimatter powered vessel. I'm just showing you how the basic stuff works. And then I got to go feed my cat because my cat is letting me know it wants food. All right, so here we go. Um, so receiving power, got to, and then fire. Okay. So over here you notice a um, little bit of thrust, 
uh, about quarter thrust, 36.8 kilonewtons, and it's staying steady. It's not like slowly dropping off, so that's good. All right, so we increase all the way to full. We have 94.4 kilonewtons of thrust, and it is holding steady. 94.4, 94.4, it's not, it's not budging. All right, so our waste heat, if we take a look here, is sitting right just below half, um, and it's starting to reach equilibrium. So we could maintain this comfortably for a while. So let's see what do we got here. Uh, the vessel weighs 16 and a half tons. Um, since we're orbiting Minimus, we're already on an escape trajectory. And we have liquid hydrogen for days. So we're going to run out of antimatter uh, before we run out of anything else. And look at that, we just ran out of antimatter. So we are uh, out, of, out of juice. Um, so I yeah, definitely want to stock up on a lot more antimatter on this vessel, but let's see how far that got us. Um, so yeah, it put us not, not very far. Um, so the majority of uh, what you're going to need to get this thing going is a lot of antimatter. Um, Antihydrogen would probably be better. Um, I think honestly a better case scenario would be uh, something along these lines. I'll show you real quick. All right, so you might opt for a different setup. Um, you know, have yourself a diamagnetic antimatter container down here, just chock full of antihydrogen. Um, about 13 kilograms of antihydrogen, that's a lot. And then, you know, a good six grams of uh, positrons. And then this thing will not need the beamed power, so you can just use that as a radiator. And you'll actually get a little bit better performance out of it, especially since we can scale these up. Uh, to their full size since we don't have to worry about them being blocked. So we'll do that, and then that, and then that, and then... yeah. Okay, let's see how that flies. Oh good, this thing's uh, about to overheat and explode. That's always glorious. <laughs> uh, this is so not good. Okay, alright, let's, uh, let's get into orbit before we disintegrate. Okay, much better. Do, 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 do. Oh wait, no, I wanted that, didn't I? All right, so we'll keep that, 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 and that. Okay. Um, Positron reactor online, and magnetic nozzle, here we go, 94.4 kilowatts, or kilonewtons, um, so max maximum there for that particular size of engine, and waste heat seems to be, climb, oh, I forgot to deploy my radiator, so I always do that, let's go ahead and deploy, deploy, and deploy. There we go, now we're looking for that. No, that's better. Okay, so positrons, hardly using any. Antihydrogen, hardly using any. Um, so that's a much, much more uh, concentrated use of juice there. So you can see that it's using the antihydrogen slowly, and it's replenishing positrons as it does that. So the positrons are staying full. Um, so we didn't even need to start off full because this thing will decay you know, positrons into that. So it will have power for a good long time. So at 94.4 kilonewtons of thrust, so we're already at apoapsis 2, 90, 300,000. Let's see how far we can go uh, before we run out of fuel. I guess I guess we're going towards the sun. I guess that's where, where we're going today. Why not? <laughs> Looking pretty good on fuel. Okay.
cool. We are nowhere near the point of running out of fuel. Um, and we've already got 12,000 meters per second. Um, it's been accelerating for about 90 minutes now. Um, barely, barely scratched our fuel reserves. Still full on positrons and uh, anti-hydrogen. I haven't, I haven't hardly touched any. Uh, maximum of this is 13.244 kilograms. We are at 13.1501 kilograms. So we've hardly used any of our fuel at all, be it hydrogen, anti-hydrogen, or anything else. Um, and we're, we're trucking along at 12,000 meters per second. And if waste heat is dead even stable, it is at zero. No accumulation or dissipation. It's just at, hanging out at zero right in the middle there, okay? And we're just gonna keep going. Um, yeah. Now I suppose what I could do is um, wait until I get like, you know, here, and then see if it'll, see, I can just use that to kind of catapult me across, but I'm actually just gonna continue to thrust prograde um, until we run out of fuel. So we're probably going to intersect the sun at some point. Oh, no, maybe not. Looks like we'll actually get a little bit of a boost. Okay, we are moving at 155,570 meters per second. Um, thinking that's pretty fast. We've used half of our hydrogen gas um, as far as our antimatter annihilation, so uh, we can use liquid hydrogen for annihilation, so no worries there. Um, but basically this reactor, if we open up the window here, uh, tells us that it can last for, uh, it can basically burn for another 22 days before it runs out of antiprotons. Pretty cool. I don't know if we'll actually do that for 22 days, but I'm gonna see how fast we get in just a few minutes. Oh. Um, okay. So somewhere around 216,000, 538, 0.9 meters per second, we disintegrated um, right around here near the sun. Um, the antimatter container blew up due to g-forces or temperature or something like that, um, but there you go. Uh, if you manage that tiny little quirk, um, you clearly see that you have a 17-ton vessel that can eventually get up to light speed if you don't disintegrate first. Um, so yeah, have fun with that, and uh, next video we do, um, I'll, uh, I'll show you some ins and outs of some other ways that you can use this. But that's the gist of using the plasma, um, or the beam core antimatter reactor for propulsion. Feed it power, feed it protons, feed it antiprotons, and feed it radiators. And it will just go forever once you get that. Alright folks, have fun.